Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 80, East Africa, Part 2. After the fall of Cyrenaica, the war, at least away from the English Channel, was in a state of flux. Would the British Commonwealth forces continue to push west in North Africa? Would the combined Axis powers push back, now that rumors of German reinforcements heading to Tripoli seemed real? And what would happen in Greece? Would the Italians be pushed into the sea? Would Hitler allow that? Could Hitler allow that? Could German troops be rushed there in time to stop it? And in East Africa, would the falling back and condensing of Italian troops be just the ticket to hold off the coming British, Indian, and African troops? Or would the Allies make a clean sweep of the African continent altogether? Of course, everyone was spying on everyone else, but each side knew exactly what they were going to do. And in war, just like in chess or business, it's almost always best to be the one taking the initiative and letting the other react to your moves. But though decisions had been made, that state of flux remained, in some small part, on both sides. Churchill might have steered the British cause to Greece, but it was still Wavell's job to consider all the options. On February 10th, the C&C Middle East, in a rare moment of two minds, wrote to the war office. The extent of the Italian defeat at Benghazi seems to me to make it possible that Tripoli might yield to a small force if dispatched without delay. I am working out the size of the force that would be required, but hesitate to advance further in view of the Balkan situation. But if you think the capture of Tripoli might have favorable effect on attitude of French North Africa, I will make plans for the capture of Surti, which must be the first step. Please cable me your views as to effect on Vegan and war situation generally. We'll probably go to Cyrenaica on 12th or 13th February to discuss with Wilson. On the other side of the conflict, Alfredo Guzzoni, who replaced Bagdolio as Italian Deputy Chief of Staff, told General Rommel on the next day, February 11th, quote, If it becomes clear in the course of the next few days that Tripoli cannot be held, I will be the first to admit that it is not worth sending German units to Libya only to be captured by the enemy, unquote. The Germans in general, and Rommel in particular, probably appreciated this rather direct talk. That same evening, February 11th, the British Defense Committee, with Churchill in the chair, talked of Britain's next move and Wavell's telegram of the previous day. And as we saw last time, Tripoli was out. After the meeting, both the Chiefs of Staff and the Prime Minister sent Wavell a letter. Here's a part of what Churchill had to say. Quote, our first thought must be for our ally Greece, who is actually fighting so well. If Greece is trampled down or forced to make a separate peace with Italy, yielding also air and naval strategic points against us to Germany, effect on Turkey will be very bad. But if Greece, with British aid, can hold out for some months German advance, chances of Turkish intervention will be favored. Therefore, it would seem that we should try to get in a position to offer the Greeks the transfer to Greece of the fighting portion of the army which has hitherto defended Egypt, and make every plan for sending and reinforcing it to the limit with men and material. Unquote. He then went on to say that he would send out Foreign Secretary Eden and Chief of the Imperial General Staff, John Dill, to talk everything over with the CNCs in Cairo or Athens. He hoped a part of what the Greeks were told was that Britain could offer up at least four divisions, including one armored division. But then, near the end of his communique, Churchill did his own wavering. Quote, in the event of its proving impossible to reach any good agreement with the Greeks and work out a practical military plan, then we must try to save as much from the wreck as possible. We must, at all costs, keep Crete. We could also reconsider the advance on Tripoli. Unquote. 
To wit, Wavell wavered right back, but he tried not to. As all the troops heading to Greece were coming from his command, the desert war would be open to a renewed Axis offensive. But the thoughtful CNC felt comfortable with his risk. He later wrote of his thinking at the time, quote, No definite information to justify our expecting the presence of German troops in Africa had been received up to the middle of February. I estimated that it would be at least two months after the landing of German forces at Tripoli before they could undertake a serious offensive against Cyrenaica, and that, therefore, was not likely to be any serious threat to our positions there before May at the earliest. That it would be safe to have comparatively unequipped and untrained troops there, so long as their training and equipment would be completed by May. Unquote. In this, it is hard to blame Wavell. The German general staff and Hitler felt the same way. But Rommel's fellow officers, German, British, and Italian, as well as his supreme commander, did not know Rommel's real character. But as for the British, Churchill misjudged the size of the forces heading to Tripoli, and Wavell miscalculated time in Rommel's world. Wavell also thought he had time for other post-Operation Compass items. General O'Connor was exhausted and required rest. He was sent to take over from Wilson the position of Commander British Troops Egypt in the Delta Nile, while, as we covered earlier, Wilson was heading west as the new military governor of Cyrenaica. As commanders were moving around, their men got their orders as well. And following Churchill's instructions, by the time Wavell was done, there were no experienced troops in Cyrenaica. Heading to Greece were the following. The 2nd New Zealand Division, it was untried. The 6th Australian Division, experienced. The 7th Australian Division, partially trained. The 1st Armored Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division, it was untried. And the Polish Brigade, partially trained equipped. Some of the rifles were now in East Africa. The Desert Rats were ordered to Egypt proper to refit. And in this state of flux, of moving forces around, of leaders thinking out their options, the great irony of this moment was that now was the perfect time to implement Churchill's plan of letting those Italian forces in East Africa waste away on the vine. Those enemy forces were retreating because of, mostly, Operation Compass, and not because of General Platt and General Cunningham's daring, not even Colonel Wingate's fiery eyes and steel determination. Again, no one had a crystal ball, and these men were doing what they thought was best. So, the experienced men were heading to Greece to be vastly outnumbered. Untried and untrained men were given the assignment to hold up the Italians and whatever German forces would soon be in Tripoli, and a mixture of trained and tried men and untrained and untried men would continue to move against the Italians in East Africa. Last time, we left units of the 4th Indian Division in northern Eritrea, just miles away from their objective of Karen. But since February 1st, they had been staring at a rock wall and its one opening to the Dungalas Gorge, which was guarded by superiorly numerous Italian troops with well-placed and more numerous artillery. And although other Italian generals in East Africa were giving in to panic, as time would soon show, General Fruski was not, and he didn't need to. He had the higher ground, was adequately supplied, and his enemies could not make a single move without his observing it. To be precise, the rock wall was really a series of rock-strewn mountains, whose height rose to 2,000 feet from the valley floor. But the Italian's position, on the right side of the opening of the gorge, was the highest point. And there was only one way to get to their guns, and that was through the gorge. In short, a vicious and ironic tactical cycle. The other part of this ironic situation 
at least for the Allies, was that, as the Italians had placed their guns just on their side of any peak, they could not be seen or fired upon by Allied troops. And again, besides the mountains on the left side of the opening, all that remained was the valley floor. So, for Beresford Pierce, his men were either climbing up steep hills or totally out in the open for Italian guns. In short, there was no place to hide near the opening they needed to get to. Still, the Italians had shown themselves tough defenders at first, only to fade away with time. And this is what General Platt was hoping for slash counting on. It was time to apply some pressure. So, Brigadier Savory's 11th Indian Infantry Brigade was chosen to go in first, to attack the Dungolas Gorge. Before we go any further, a mental map is in order. Picture a square map on a table. The Dungolas Gorge, at least the first part of it, runs like a line from the bottom left corner to the top right corner. And at the center of our map is the opening to the gorge. The Commonwealth forces are on the far left bottom. The Italians are stationed on the right side of the opening, at Fort Dologorodok. Savory's men are going to cross the Asidera Valley, located between themselves and the left side of the opening. The Italians will not seriously contest this move, as it is still far enough away from the opening. But the Indian Brigade is not heading for the opening. That would be suicide, and the Italians know this. Their destination is to the left of the opening, and a bit to the north. There, a series of high hills, or small mountains, shoot up into the air that would allow the Allies to dominate the surrounding area. If the hills can be captured and artillery brought up, it would be a solid, and probably their own, move to shell the Italian guns. On the left side, the highest hill is called Sanchil, and it is the closest to the opening. About 400 yards northwest of Sanchil is another hill that we will call Briggs Peak. To the southwest of Sanchil, about 500 yards away, is a ridge that is connected to Sanchil, and we will call that Cameron Ridge. The reasons for these names will soon be apparent. Starting February 5th, Savory's men moved out and spent the next three days moving from hill to hill, edging ever closer to Sanchil. By the end of the third day, the second Cameron Highlanders had lodged themselves on a part of Sanchil, now dubbed Cameron Ridge. The men were exhausted, but elated, and Savory ordered an attack for that very night, as any daylight advance was impossible. Going on sheer guts and enthusiasm, his men managed to reach the top of Sanchil and another peak to the northwest, now dubbed Briggs Peak. In relation to the opening of the gorge, Briggs Peak was behind Sanchil, but it helped cover Sanchil's rear. Not that it mattered. Savory's 11th Infantry Brigade had the hill they wanted, but were exhausted for it. So, the next day, when the Italians counterattacked, the Indian Brigade was unable to resist. Not until the Italians controlled Sanchil and Briggs Peak did the 11th Infantry Brigade manage to hold back the attackers. The only hill not recaptured by the Italians was Cameron Ridge, just southwest of Sanchil. Platt, still thinking that pressure was all that was needed to defeat the Italians, then sent in Brigadier Lloyd's 5th Indian Infantry Brigade. But instead of repeating what Savory did, Lloyd decided to see if there was a back door to the Italians' fort on the right side of the gorge. So, flanking the gorge's opening by some 4,000 yards to the right, Lloyd's Rajpuntana rifles climbed up another rise called Aqua Call, and through small advanced parties, kept moving forward. Perhaps there was a path that led to the fort's rear. But again, as the brigade got closer, all that climbing took its toll. The Italians had watched them swing around, again there was no way to hide this movement, and launched a counterattack at daylight. The exhausted riflemen gave ground, just as their comrades had, under Savory. Lloyd's men were not pushed back all the way, but the position they were now in was vulnerable to Italian guns. 
And so they made their way back to base camp, unmolested. By now, Platt, Beresford, Pierce, and his men had learned a few things. First, their artillery could not be put into a place to assist an infantry attack. Second, by the time their men rushed up a hill to fight, they were too exhausted to hold off a counterattack. And lastly, the Indians, though used to this type of geography, did not have their mules with them. So, supplies had to be carried on their backs. This wore them out even before any possible combat could take place. Harping back to the first problem, their artillery, vis-a-vis the superior position of the Italians' artillery, begged for air power. But at the moment, the Italians still controlled the skies over the contested area. Hey everyone, Ray here. We've all been there. Seemingly out of nowhere, you get hit by an unexpected bill, and your world just stops. When that happens, you panic, so it's hard to think, what are my options? Well, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart is here to help. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt or help you survive that unexpected bill with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. And just know, you are not alone. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers who are on their path to financial freedom with a fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows that you are more than just your credit score, which is why they factor in your income, employment, and other information in your loan application. That's how they get you the best deal. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. Before these two failed attacks, Bearsford Pierce believed he was only days away from Karen, but his plans had, so far, not worked out. The Italians were sticking around and not playing to form, i.e. bugging out when things got intense. But what Bearsford Pierce did not know was that the troops fighting against him were the Duke of Aosta's best men, the Savoa and units from the other elite division, the Bersaglieri, and Beresford Pierce's losses were adding up fast. Savory's brigade lost two battalion commanders, three company commanders, and 280 men. Lloyd's losses were 223 men, all ranks. Frustrated but realistic, Platt had Beresford Pierce call off future attacks until something could be worked out. The rest of February was spent searching for other routes to the fort while additional troops and ammunition were brought forward. One definition of insanity is to try something over and over and expect different results. And neither Platt nor Beresford Pierce were insane. It was time to call in the RAF. The Western Theater, the Gajam region. On February 6th, Emperor Haley Selassie rode out of the jungle, having reached Mount Balea exhausted and dirty, and on the back of a mule. But it had been worth it. Now that the locals could see the man for themselves, nearby local chiefs flocked to his cause and sent their men to fight by Selassie's side. But more important than that, the rumors of the size of Wingate's force grew larger and faster than its actual size. In response to these rumors, the local Italian commander panicked and decided to abandon the more isolated forts within the Gajam region. Their distance from each other and the terrain in between would have made mutual support difficult, to say the least. It was a solid tactical move, but it only fueled Wingate's fire to press on. However, the Italians were not completely giving up. As they were able to withdraw unharassed, they focused and condensed their forces into fewer locations, some near Lake Tana, 
located about 50 miles northeast of Mount Pelea, while the remaining forces were relocated to Bury and Deborah Marcos along the main road to Addis Ababa. But their defensive posturing did not stop there. Taking a different tact, the Italians tried a political move that would, hopefully, stem the building tide against them. As they left the Gajem region, they put in charge a local chief named Ras Halu. He was the main chieftain of the traditional Gajem dynasty and a known rival to Haile Selassie. One can almost picture the Italian commander say, Here you go, and good luck. Not surprisingly, this move did not stop the emperor and Wingate from gathering adherents. As things stood now, there was no immediate military opposition to Wingate's force, Gideon. There was no real political threat to oppose Selassie, but there was a geographical obstacle blocking them both. Between the Gajam region and the capital, Addis Ababa, there was an escarpment that ran for hundreds of miles to the left and right of their present position. Fortunately for Wingate, a long-forgotten path was rediscovered in the Mitakal area, southwest of Mount Balea. I'm sure his remaining camels appreciated this. And on February 15th, Wingate, Selassie, their 450 men and hundreds of camels set out on the path. Within five days, the travelers were well into the rises of the escarpment. At this point, Wingate's men spread out, looking for other paths, or just making sure they were always on the correct and therefore easiest path. It was then that they started running into Italian forces manning the heights. The Italians at Denghila, shocked at the sight of their enemy approaching, evacuated. Through his scouts, Wingate found out that the important fort at Ingiabara was also being evacuated. This fort's important was not only based on the size of the force stationed there and its location on one of the highest points, but also on the amount of supplies there. Wingate, finding out this last part due to local reconnaissance, pressed on and got to Ingiabara before the retreating Italians could gather everything up. Stunned, Wingate found himself with a month's supply of food for his approximately 450 men. So armed, or supplied, Wingate, still with fire in his eyes, turned his daring thoughts to making for the main road that led to Addis Ababa. In fact, his next target was the Italian troops that had moved out of the Gajam region and settled down to the relative safety of fortified Bire. So, Gideon, his force, was on the move again, heading out on February 25th. Waiting for him at Bire was Colonel Natale, with his 7,000 men, supported by artillery. Wingate, vastly outmanned, came on anyway. As much as we have talked about how terrain affected battles, it was no less true for Wingate and Natale. As Gideon came closer to Bire and within Italian eyesight, the difficult terrain caused his 450 men and 700 camel caravan to spread out. Natale believed, because of this, that Wingate's force was much larger than it actually was. And note, this was happenstance. It would be false to give the British colonel credit for the idea. Besides, Wingate had enough clever ideas of his own. Having some of his much smaller force swing around Beret, the Allied troops attacked forts around the city, but also launched raids against some of Natale's retreating points, should he find himself needing to make for Deborah Marcos, further to the southeast and closer to the capital. These actions convinced Natale that a much larger force was not only attacking him, but making sure he would not be able to retreat, if he so chose. Now, Natale's nerves were shaken, and his anxiety rippled out to his men. But if that wasn't enough, Wingate then had loudspeakers hooked up, and had messages blared throughout the day and night of what would happen to the local soldiers who had turned against Emperor Selassie years ago. The desertions from the Italian army started that very night. The RAF did its part with sporadic bombings of Italian positions, 
Not enough to make a difference on their own, but certainly more than enough to shake the already quivering Natale. Seeing the writing on the wall, or in this case, the escarpment, more and more local chiefs came over to the emperor's side and again sent their men to fight beside him. And that leaves us with General Cunningham in the south. But I think another mental map is needed here. Picture on a map the port city of Kismayu on a coastline that runs to the northeast. To the northeast of Kismayu itself, about 10 miles inland, is the Gobwin Airfield. And just to the east of that is where the river Juba comes inland. Now, the Juba itself runs in a rough northeasterly direction, which is important because the main fort protecting Kismayu, Afmadu, is about 55 miles away, but in a northwesterly direction. So, if you picture an upside-down triangle, you'll have it. Kismayu is the upside-down point, the river Juba is the line on the right, and Afmadu is the far left corner. Make sense? I just don't want you thinking that Godwin Austin is coming along the coast. His force is actually about 60 miles or so inland, because they have to take out Afmadu first, and then swing south and approach Kismayu from the rear. But even then, they are still well west of Juba, because it runs from all of this to the northeast. Okay, let's get back to the story. Just like when Operation Compass was put into place, Wavell ordered General Cunningham to write nothing down. So, when Operation Canvas, Cunningham's attack on Kismayu, started February 11th, it was surrounded by absolute secrecy. The main attacking force, Major General Godwin Austin's 12th African Division, was already 250 miles east of Nairobi when they started to move out. This left them with another 250 miles before reaching the Kismayu Afmadu area. As they were located inland near the upper river Tana, they would have other forces on either flank. Covering Godwin Austin's west or left flank was Major General Brink's 1st South African Division. It was heading in a northwesterly direction to the right side of Lake Rudolph in northern Kenya slash southern Abyssinia just in case an Italian attack was launched at Kenya after Godwin Austin moved out. Meanwhile, on Godwin Austin's right flank along the coast was Major General Wetherall's 11th African Division. Theirs was a more direct path to Kismayu than the main force, but there were things to do first before the port city could be taken. After gathering as much information on the Italian's disposition as possible, this was Cunningham's plan. Protecting Kismayu was the Italian's main fort, Afmadu, located at a point 40 miles west of River Juba and 50 miles inland. Godwin Austin would advance on February 11th and take the fort. Then his 1st South African Brigade would turn south and head in a southeasterly direction and come down until they were behind or on the eastern side of Kismayu. Meanwhile, Wetherall's division, making straight east, would approach Kismayu from the west or in front. Once Wetherall's men were in front of Kismayu, Godwin Austin's men would make their presence known. The Italians at the port city would see that they were surrounded and hopefully surrender. Simple but straightforward and hard to muck up. However, if there was a flaw in this plan, it was their lack of supplies. If Kismayu did not fall by February 21st, Cunningham's men would have to withdraw and make their way to Kenya once again and wait for additional supplies. But there was no need to fear. The Italians had already started to melt away. The credit for this must go to squadrons of the South African Air Force. On February 10th, the day before the attack was to start, Units from the South African Air Force took control of the skies over the area of operations. That same day, they bombed whatever Italian positions they could find, particularly focusing on Afmadu. So, that fort was taken unopposed. As planned, some units then turned south and headed southeast. While the Gold Coast Brigade maintained their easterly route and made for another fort at Bulo Irio, just east of the river Juba. 
The Gold Coast Brigade had to fight their way there, but the Italian's heart wasn't in it. Bulo Erio fell on February 13th. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters, making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity, and taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach, so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, but there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events. There's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Also during the 13th, the 1st South African Brigade had made their way to within 10 miles of the Gobwin Airfield, which is itself about 5 miles away to the northeast of Kismayu. During the day of the 13th, Commander Brigadier Dan Pienaar who was under orders not to use his radio or move during daylight, waited for dusk. So when he heard explosions coming from the direction of Kismayu, he assumed the Italians were preparing to withdraw. But he couldn't do anything about it. Orders were orders. Finally, dusk came, and he moved out. His men quickly took the undefended Goblin airfield, which left PNR still plenty of darkness to work with. So, he continued on to Kismayu. If PNR was hoping for a repeat performance at Kismayu, he was mistaken. Mostly. His men soon met stiff resistance and planned for a long fight. After all, there was no reason to hide in the bush anymore. The Italians knew they were there. But as the fighting continued, PNR and his men noticed something odd. As the Italians engaged his men, certainly fighting more fiercely than thought possible, they never stopped moving, always heading east. They would charge forward, guns blazing, and then head for the coast. PNR figured out that their evacuation was indeed on, and he didn't have the men necessary to stop them. PNR let them go, but all the while making sure the Italians didn't double back and attack him from the rear. Again, prudence pays. But the Italians didn't. Kismayu was taken on the evening of February 14th, six days before supplies were to run out. Despite this latest Allied success, General Di Simone still held the crossings over the River Juba to the east and showed no signs of further retreating. General Cunningham, glad of the latest news, had Godwin Austin probe the entire length of the Juba, from Godwin Airfield to Bulo Arillo, some 50 miles inland. The news was not good. Near the airfield, the river was about 600 feet wide, and at any point that was found, wadeable had intense, thick jungle on each bank, so vehicles would have to be left behind not a compromise they were willing to make. Hoping to outmaneuver the Italians, a different tactic was chosen. On the night of February 17th, the South Africans set up a bridgehead at Yonti, 10 miles upstream from Gobwin Airfield. Two days later, the Gold Coast Brigade pushed back the opposing Italians and created their own bridgehead 30 more miles upstream at Mabungo. Now, having two points in which to launch surprise attacks on Italian troops between the two bridgeheads caused Di Simone's force to pull back. And on February 22nd, Godwin Austin's men took Jellop, a town on the Italian side of the river, across from Bulo Erio, again about 50 miles upstream from the coast. 
With the Italians pulling back, or to the east, so far upstream, the path to southern Abyssinia was now open. But General Platt found himself with another adversary to deal with, the coming monsoons. He had recently found out that the rains came to his area of operations before they would be in eastern Abyssinia. So, could Platt's men keep the Italians moving, stay supplied themselves, and stay ahead of the rains? That was their next challenge. His staff put their heads together and began their calculations. The result was that only three brigades could be supplied and moved if the remaining troops were stripped of everything with wheels. The idea was to head east, take Mogadishu, and then turn north and make for Harar, deep in eastern Abyssinia, touching British Somaliland. As the men moved on, supplying them would only get harder, but if British Somaliland, or at least Bera Bera, could be retaken, then supplying those three brigades would become that much more easier near the end of their trek. This was more critical than it may sound. By the time the Allied forces made it even close to Harar, the rains would have come to eastern Abyssinia. So, Cunningham asked Wavell if he could move forward onto Harar, and if someone else could take Berbera. Wavell said yes to both of these. So, on February 23rd, Witherall's 11th African Division crossed the Juba and made for Mogadishu, their ultimate goal being Harar. The 23rd Nigerian Brigade led the way. And now, if we zoom out away from East Africa, North Africa, away from the Mediterranean, from Greece, away from Europe, at this point in the conflict, it is easy to argue that, at this moment in time, it is, for the British Commonwealth forces and their Greek allies, their high water mark. The Italians are barely holding on in Albania, are extremely vulnerable in North Africa, and are losing possessions fast in East Africa. The German Luftwaffe is hammering away on southern Britain and the Midlands, but are paying a terrible price for their moderate successes. The United Kingdom's selfish Russian allies and inexperienced American allies are still in the future. And sitting on top of the British Empire, leading his people, giving them hope, is the flawed but infused with defiant energy Winston Spencer Churchill. So, before Rommel launches his attacks in North Africa, and General List's 18 divisions come pouring down on Greece, while Hitler's secret attack on Russia is gearing up, we will take a look at the life of Churchill, the British Bulldog. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. It's raining really hard here, and it's been doing that, say, for the last three or four months. Uh, it's become a way of life for us here. Uh, just a couple things before I let you go. The tour is looking very good. looks like it's going to happen this fall. Thank you to everyone who sent emails in. You'll be getting um, itinerary as soon, as soon as it's officially available. I have to get together with my tour guy who's on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast, and Paul Finch, my tech web designer is in Scotland and all three of us have to Skype and communicate to get everything on the website. So that should be happening soon, hopefully this week. Um, so just, um, let me know if you're interested. You can always email me at WWII podcast at gmail.com or Ray at world war spelled out. I I podcast.net. Either one of those is fine. Just send me an email and I'll get it to the tour guy so you can, receive the blast email once it goes out about all the uh, information. It's looking like we're going to be able to keep the original itinerary, which I'm very excited about. London, um, Paris, Normandy, Dunkirk, General Patton's grave site, uh, a part of uh, the Maginot Line, and ending up in Belgium. So I'm very excited about this. Please, if there's any way you can go, I just... I've got to get over there. I've got to see these places, but I can't do it without you. So if, if you want to, just send me an email. And I'll make sure you get all the information. I uh, just want to quickly thank my newest members, um, Paul D., Ben C., and William O. And thank you for donations from Stephen C. in uh, California and Brian L. from Cork, 
Ireland. I hope I said that right. So I will uh, see you as soon as I can with the first part of Ch- the Churchill bio. And I just want to get some stuff out of the way, um, like Enigma, the Churchill bio, before we um, let Rommel start running crazy. So uh, I'll get through all that stuff as soon as I can, and we'll get back to the action. I just think it's important to establish some of these things and, and pick up things that I've missed. And for you members out there who have written to me or commented on the website that you're excited we're back to the Krupp storyline, I am too. It's really amazing what they do. We haven't even gotten into um, the amazing influence that they have on Germany uh, as a country and the armaments. Um, I did enjoy very much the guinea pig club. I learned a lot. Those men are just absolutely amazing, and they're heroes in every sense of the word. So we'll keep the uh, Krupp story coming as well. Um, so, again, um, it's been raining here for months. If anybody's good at um, boating, yachting, or maybe building an ark, maybe you should consider coming to Virginia and saving me. I'll see you as soon as I can, everybody. Take care, everyone.